Go. Good morning. This is the first in a series of interactive lectures on children's fractures. The purpose of these lectures is really to reinforce what the participants have read, to using this to reinforce it so that they'll really get a better idea of the basic principles and how to treat children's fractures. First, we're going to talk about fractures in children and the fact that they are unique, they're different. You know, this lecture may not seem very exciting, but you know, to have a good understanding of how to fra manage fractures in the skeletally mature patient, you really have to have an understanding of the structure and failure and patterns of the skeletal system in the pediatric patient. In other words, we're gonna go back to the basic science that you learned in medical school. And we'll see examples of this where it's very important that you review this. Now, it's important to remember, and everybody has told you this in pediatrics, the normal child's not a miniature adult. So you have to have different principles. You can't take the principles of the adult and just make them smaller. So what is it about bones in the immature patient that makes them different from the adult? Definitely. The physis. Well, the differences are due to what? Growth. Growth, that's right. Differences are due to growth. And because of that, the bone structure has different biomechanical characteristics. Pediatric fractures have, they got greater osteogenic potential, they heal better, quicker, and we have increased remodeling capacity, which we'll see later in this lecture, really helps us in our treatment of these as long as you understand the basic principles of that. So, now we have two types of bone. We got the tissue bone, and the organ bone. So what's the characteristics of tissue bone? Characteristics. Uh. Well, first it's a very rigid tissue. And where are the osteocytes? Well, the osteocytes, it's only on the surface, and so these osteocytes are kind of locked in up in the, the, the matrix of the bone, it doesn't expand. And once they get in there, they can't reproduce. And so, how does a bone gonna reproduce? So next we have organ bone. And the organ bones are what? Well, any of the bones, like the radius, the ulna, the tibia, the femur, and so forth. So, they have multiple functions. You know, they have hematopoietic functions, they have structure functions, support. They also are the sources of calcium and phosphorus in the body, so forth, which is important. And, but they've got to grow. These organs have to grow. Remember we said that the cells themselves cannot grow. So how does the organ bone grow? So we have the, the organs are modified so that they can get larger as the child gets bigger. So how do the organs grow in length? Or the well, they have a certain type of tissue that's expanded in there, and what do you, what's that process called? It's called, it's bone formation, but it's endochondral ossification. So, let's look at the different unique physeal anatomy. And we'll look at each part of the physis. This is the physis. The physis is, is the so-called the epiphyseal plate or the growth plate. But the technical term, the best term, is physis, which, which comes from the Greek word physis, fight, to uh, produce. So what happens up here on the epiphyseal side? What, what's unique about that? The blood supply. That's exactly right. Yeah, the blood supply comes in, and that's very, very critical. That supplies what goes on here, this layer. What goes on this layer? Oh, that's the... Uh yeah, that's right. That's where you have the cells that are growing, and they're supplied through the epiphysis. Uh, the resting cells are supplied through the epiphysis right here by the blood supply. So that's very, very critical. What happens here? What happens here? Hypertrophic. Yeah, hyper they become hyper hypertrophic. Why, why do the cells hypertrophy? Well, it's because they outgrow their vascular supply, 
and uh, they, they, they die. Actually, is what's happening is that these cells have outgrown their vascular supply because it gets it from up here in the epiphysis, and so you get it from up in the epiphysis, and so they um, outgrows their blood supply, and that allows the matrix to calcify. So is this really cell maturation? Is this uh, is, is in bone production is the cartilage converted to bone? Or is it replaced by bone? Replaced by bone. It's replacement. It's a replacement process. The cartilage cells have an expansile matrix and allow it to expand. And then once they outgrow their blood supply, they're dead and they are replaced by bone. So, is this cell maturation? No, it's cartilage cell death that occurs right here. So, what's the difference between and that matrix? Because the cells have died, becomes. Uh, calcified. What's the difference between calcification and ossification? What do we? What is calcification? Calcification is just where calcium uh, infiltrates the. That's cell. right. It's a pathologic condition that we see in the calcium salts. Normally, in the blood, the calcium and phosphorus are hypermolality, and if you don't have an inhibitory me mechanism, they will precipitate. So, it occurs in non-viable tissue, and normally they're hypersaturated in normal tissue, but there's a, and there's a substance there that prevents that saturation to, from becoming participating, and, and then we call this dystrophic calcification, because it occurs in dyed and dead tissue because you've lost that inhibitory substance. Because of the death of the matrix, the hypersaturation of the calcium and phosphorus is allowed to precipitate in the matrix. Now, what's ossification? Uh, growth or calcification? Of well, yeah, it's an orderly process. It's a development process in bone formation. It's a biological process, organic process, and it results in the ordered development of bone tissue and osseous tissue, not calcified tissue, osseous tissue. But it occurs in viable tissue. The tissue in bone is living. So, we'll go ahead now that we've talked about the difference between calcification and ossification. Here in the hypertrophy zone, we have calcification. That calcified matrix is removed. And what happens here in this section? Well, that's where the dead cartilage is removed. The new blood cells come in and they have chondroclasts and they're removed. And what happens here? Well, what, what kind of cells come in here from the blood vessels? Osteocytes, osteoblasts. And what do osteoblasts do? They become osteocytes. And then they will lay down an osseous matrix, not a calcified matrix. It does contain calcium, but it contains other substances as well. So this is where you have ossification. So remember, in this growth process, you have dystrophic calcification and then viable ossification. So, it's really important that you understand which are the critical part. The blood supply, as you said, goes through the epiphysis and it goes to the resting cells. That's how the cells get their nourishment. That's the dangerous side. If you're going to work on this and we're doing repair, and we'll talk in some later lectures, you want to avoid this because you want you don't want to devascularize it. So, what happens if you lose the blood supply? You allow cell death. That's exactly right. The cells become ischemic and die, and you've lost the cessation of growth. So you stop the growth, and so the growth ceases. That's right. Well, what happens on the other side if you lose the blood supply? That's the safe side because you can. You can work on that, you can operate on that side and so forth, and you can do just about anything you want there. But what happens if you lose the blood supply on the metaphyseal side, the reabsorption side? Overgrowth. I'm sorry? Overgrowth? Yeah. Well, it's not exactly overgrowth, it's lack of, of it's actually a lack of reabsorption of that dead cartilage. You don't have the blood vessels to absorb that calcified dead cartilage in cells. And so it fails to absorb, and so they have a large mass of cartilage that's not absorbed. 
And we see this, as we'll talk about later on, in leg Perthes disease. In leg Perthes disease, you have loss of blood supply both on the epiphyseal side and the metaphyseal side. And on the metaphyseal side, you have a failure of the cartilage to be absorbed and you have these big osseous, I mean these big defects, radiolucent defects, which are really nothing more than tongues of cartilage that haven't been reabsorbed. And one of the best ways to tell that you're getting new blood supply is those cartilage cells are disappearing, those dead cartilage, and you're getting new bone formation. Now it's beginning to ossify. So, we've seen how the bones will grow in length. How do they grow in width? What's the process? Remember this. That's right. It's a surface phenomenon, remember. And so it's, it's called intramembranous ossification, and the new bone is, uh, is deposited on the surface. Remember, it's all the activity is on the surface. And also, we get reabsorption on the inner surface in the medullary canal. So we've got new bone laid down on the surface, and it grows bigger and bigger on the surface. It's new bone inside, the bone is reabsorbed. In the event of the periosteum that we see here, the endosteum, it's reabsorbed internally that we see here. So, now, let's look at the basic process of normal remodeling. This is the beauty of treating children because they do have a tremendous remodeling capacity. Really, when you have a bone as it's growing, it starts out and it produces new bone, which is weak, produces a lot of quantity bone. So that's a quantity amount of bone. It's weak, it's, it's very immature, it's not laid down lanes of stress. And then with time, it gets remodeled into strong bone in which we now have quality bone. So. Because of this, we have different matrices. We have the matrix of the physis, or the growth plate, the metaphysis, and the diaphysis. And these are all Greek terms. Meta means next to, and dia means in between. So, how does this structure affect the failure patterns? Well, it has a unique failure patterns because of this. We have unique fa failure patterns. And we'll go through each one, and we'll go start with the physis, the metaphysis, and the diaphysis, and destroy, and learn the different failure patterns because of the structure is different. First, let's talk about failure of the physis. Bone tissue is rigid, and of course, therefore, what allows it to expand? Well, there's a modification in the architecture, we talked about that, and there's a physis, which has an expansal cartilage con and will allow it to grow. That's the positive side. What's the downside of that? What is the downside of that? It's weaker. Yeah, that's right. So it can fail either in tension or shear forces. If you apply tension and shear forces, often in children, the failure will occur through the weaker physis, which we don't see in the adult. Bending stresses about the knee, here's a good example. If you have an adult, you get failure of the collateral ligaments if you have a severe valgus stress. What do you get in the child? Iso-injury. Yeah. The, the, remember, the ligaments are stronger than the physis and the, and the adjacent bone, and so the failure occurs through the physis. And here's a good example. This is a football player. What do you see on the x-rays? Uh, some widening of the, the physis. Yeah, Medial. right. Yeah, on his right knee. And the, the coach and the trainer ran out, he got, he got hit from the side, he had a valgus force, he couldn't walk, went out there and checked his knee and it opened up and he said, oh my lord, he's got a bad knee ligament injuries. And because he opened up when you did a valgus stress on him. But where did the failure occur? In the physis. Yeah, because the ligaments are stronger. Remember, the resistance to tension forces is greater in the ligaments. Now. This is a newborn baby. She was born in 1965, so she's probably, what, about 50 years old now. Anyway, she was born and was a shoulder dystocia, and, and afterwards her arm was displaced like this, and they said, oh my Lord, she's got a dislocated shoulder. Is that what she has? No, sir. Oh, yeah. So what's unique about the secondary ossification center at this age? It's not ossified. It ossifies later. The, the, the secondary ossification centers, which are in the epiphysis, 
ossify later. So it's os ossified. So what does he, she have? She has a fracture through the proximal humeral physis. And when you reduce it, you can see now she's got new bone formation. And this is the beauty of it. She went on to heal. And at six months, she's got complete remodeling. So here we go. Here's a boy, a young infant that you can see. Is this elbow dislocated? No. no. So it's not dislocated. It's a displaced total epiphysis. So what's unique about the epiphysis at this age? That it, that it's unossified. It's unossified, but what else? Well, the other thing is the medial and lateral condyles are a combined epiphysis until about the age of two, and then it becomes separate epiphyses, separate ossification centers. But at this age, it's a combined epiphysis. And so this is not a dislocated elbow. Where did the failure occur? The distal humeral the distal physis, that's right. Now, here we have a patient that had a swollen right wrist, distal uh, forearm. When you compare it with the uninjured side, what do you see there? What do you see different? The epiphysis seems to be shifted. Yeah, that's right. There seems to be some displacement of the epiphysis. So where has it failed? It's failed in the epiphysis. So it comes back, at six, you put it in a cast, it was reduced manipulated and reduced acutely, you put it in a cast, is it healed? Yeah, it is healed. But where's the callus? Why don't you see, remember we talked about healing, where's the callus? You learned that in, in, in basic uh, healing. Where's the callus? So, usually the normal growth resumes. So how do physio fractures heal? Through the physis, that's right. And so the fracture usually occurs through where? The zone of hypertrophy, that's supposed to be the weakest. We, not always does it occur through that, but characteristically in experimental animals and so forth, it, when you put a lot of tension stress or bending stress, it'll fail through the hypertrophic zone. And so you have the two fragments are separated. And so when you have the two fragments are separated, what do you do as an orthopedic surgeon? You reduce it, that's right. You set the bones, right. And so the fracture becomes reduced, and now you have the fracture reduced, you've got that fracture line, how does it heal? Well, it's very simple. Just the normal process goes along and it reabsorbs that fracture line. It goes right through, the fracture line is reabsorbed and by just the normal process of growth. That's why we don't have calcium. That's why we don't have a lot of callus formation. Okay, so that's why we don't have callus. You don't need callus to heal this type of fractures. So what happens though if there's no growth, if you've injured those growth cells? Here's a seven-year-old, a hive of energy, fell out of a tree and comes back at two years because he's got a shortening of the radius and a, and a displacement and a deformity and the thing. What's happened there? The arrest. Uh, physial arrest. But what, what has made that structure like that? Why are we not seeing any growth? Remember, bone tissue, the tissue does not grow. So here's two years post-fracture. So the basic pathology of physial arrest is that the physial cells, the growth cells, are replaced by osseous tissue and osteous tissue does not expand, so it prevents that cartilage from growing. And if you resect that, you'll find out that that bone is cortical. And it's because of the tension forces on there. You have constant tension forces on either side of the bridge, and they will stimulate, if you have tension forces or any kind of forces applied to bone, they'll stimulate bone production. And so you have cortical bone here, very thick cortical bone. And you can see if it's asymmetrical, you can hit an intraarticular fracture, and we'll talk about different fracture types through the physis. This is a Salter Harris type three. And this was noticed, he had a fracture through his knee, he was hit by a car and bicycle, and two years later his mother noticed that his pants were crooked. Well, they weren't crooked, his leg was crooked. He was getting shortening because that osseous bridge is preventing the cartilage from expanding. And it's, since it's not in the center, it's asymmetrical, and so 
the lateral side grows faster than it does on the medial side, so he gets an angular deformity associated with him. You get the angular deformity. Now, by and large, injuries around the joints, usually the failures in the physis, but that's not a 100% true. You can get ligamentous injuries, like in this girl who was six years old, and she had a rupture of her medial collateral ligament, as you can see here. So, now we talk about the metaphysis, and what's going on in the metaphysis? That's where we are um, ossifying. Well, we're remodeling. remodeling. Actually, it's, it's been ossified. We produced quantity bone, and we're going to remodel it into quality bone. And so, when you apply a longitudinal force to this weak bone, doesn't have a very thick cortex, when you apply a longitudinal force to it, what happens? Compressed? Yeah, it kind of compresses. It fails in compression. And you get this type of fracture. What type of fracture is this? What is this? A buckle fracture. That's right. A better term is torus fracture. Yeah, incomplete fracture. And so you get an incomplete fracture. A lot of these are passed off because the cortex is intact and there's no bleeding into the tissues, and so they're passed off as just a simple sprain, as you can see. And this is woven bone. This is bone that's being remodeled because you have a thin cortex. Now, this fracture is called a torus fracture because it looks like the base of a Greek column. Now, it's common anywhere you have a metaphysis. Most commonly, we see it in the distal radius. We can see it in the distal femur. You can see it in the proximal humerus. You can even see it in the, in the phalanges, at the physis of the phalanges. Now, there's some other, that's if a longitudinal compressor force is applied. What happens if you put a bending force on it? Well, again, it will fail in kind of compression. And what kind of fracture pattern do we have here? A green stick. Well, it's a compression green stick because it's still intact. Yeah. So now, if you have an increasing force, what fails next? Well, the, the, it fails. This is a tension green stick present. Now it fails. You have enough force that it has caused an avulsion or failure of the tension side. On the tension side. And if you have a really severe force, what fails? Well, both cortices will fail. And so you'll get a complete bicortical failure with complete displacement. And then you'll get shortening because you have no internal or intrinsic stability. So. This is a fracture that you have to be aware of. This is called a green stick fracture, and these have a tendency to, to have late displacement. And you can see here, there's a high incidence of late displacement of these from the muscle forces. And so this specific fracture requires a very well-molded cast, and you need to tell the parents that there may be a little displacement, but it's within the limits of remodeling. So finally, we've got the physis, we've got the metaphysis, now we come to the strongest part, which is called the diaphysis. diaphysis. That's right. So, you went to college? Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah and you had to take pre-med courses. And one of them was physics, right? Yes, sir. Okay, this is why you had to take physics to get into medical school. There are four types of deformations when a bending force is applied to the diaphysis. What's the first force? First, what's the first deformation? It's elastic. Yeah, and what's, what's, the diff what's the thing about elastic? In elastic deformation, you bend it and what happens? You haven't altered the internal structure and it comes back to its original form. In plastic deformation, what happens? It won't go back to its Yeah, that's right. You have to put some internal changes in there. And then if you apply an even more force, you get failure of one side on the tension side. And if you put a lot of force on there, you get complete failure of it. So, when you apply, this, those are the basic principles that you learned in physics just a few years ago. <laughs> All right, so what happens when you put a bending force that's applied to the diaphysis? Well, the first thing that happens, you have the zone of elastic deformation. And what happens if you bend that bone and it just elastic deformation? Okay. It goes back. That's right, exactly right. So, in the next zone, what happens? Yeah, why? Why is that? Because you have, in, you have altered the internal structure. That's right. So it begins to fatigue. The internal structure is fatiguing. So, the next zone, 
you've overloaded it, you've overloaded it, and then finally it goes out to the point which it will, will fracture, you'll f completely fail. Now there is a point in which you actually have a zone of plastic deformation. It didn't quite have enough force to go all the way to fracture, but if the, if the, the load was greater than the elastic limit, but was not quite at the fracture point, you'll get plastic deformation. And what you see, you just see a crooked bone. You don't see displacement or disruption of the cortices, call this plastic deformation. And here's a good example, and it's very common in the radius and on the shaft. And here, in this radius, we have a green stick fracture. And here, you don't see any disruption, but is it broken? Yes, it is. It's broken internally. That's the important thing. The pathology is that it's actually on the tensile side, the osteons have been kind of stretched out and pulled out. And on the compressive side, the cement lines have slipped. You remember all those things about osteons and cement lines and osteocytes? You know, we, we still have to remember some of the basic science. And this is the cement lines you can see where they've slipped. And the cement lines are between that hold the, the, the cell units together, the so-called osteocytes. So, how are these fractures best treated? This patient had an osteo, how is it best treated? Close reduction. Huh? Close reduction. Close reduction, but how do you do that? You have to do it gradually. What you have to do is you have to put gradual, constant pressure over a fulcrum. And you can see how that, when you do that, then gradually you'll realign all the osteons inside and you'll get some realignment. So, this was described about 30 years ago. Who did that? Actually, one of the orthopedic residents, Bill Sanders, and he and Dr. Hickman wrote this up in the classic article in 1984. One of the things you need to remember about this is that you probably you probably never get it fully anatomically realigned. But what's the clue that you've got a satisfactory alignment? So the loss of the deformation, at least the... Uh... Well, the motion has come back. Usually with this, it's crooked and you've lost supination and pronation. But on this one, once you've reestablished full supination and pronation, even though it's still a little crooked, it's probably okay because there's still a little remodeling capacity. So the key is to reestablishment of full anatomic motion. Now, what's the next step when a greater force, bending force is applied to the diaphysis? Um, if you go here, you go all the way through, past that, what happens? It becomes complete. Complete failure, that's right. Well, you begin to get partial failure first. And what kind of fracture do we call there? A green stick fracture? Yeah, it's a green stick fracture. It's like a green stick. Just like in, in, a, in a tree, the green stick is still immature. It has different uh, bi uh, biomechanical characteristics. Not biomechanical, but characteristics. Uh, so you can see that, a green stick fracture. And so as a be bending force is applied to a mature bone, some of this initial force is dissipated by, first, the plastic deformation when you apply it. You lose some of the force. And if you continue to have your force, you may even lose a little bit more in the elastic deformation. Deformation, And so if you have enough force left, then you'll get partial failure. If there's insufficient force to get a full failure, so it's lost some of it. So it's only so you can get partial failure. And so you have less energy to start the failure. And it takes less to start it but you don't have enough energy to complete it, as you can see here. So we call that initial one, that's the fast crack. And then that's the osteon pullout that you can see here. And remember these are the, this is a high micro magnification. You can see the different uh, osteons, how they've been pulled apart by this and how they fail. So the tension side fails first and the compression side remains in plastic deformation. So the final step when you have a bending force, a greater force, is what? Complete failure. That's right. If you get final force, you get complete failure. And so then both cortices will fail to produce a complete fracture. And so the muscle forces then now, since there's no intrinsic stability, 
will cause secondary deform deformation. The bones will then overlap. And so you have to take that in effect if you're going to correct the deformity here. So, what's an apophysis? We've been talking about physis, but what's an apophysis? So are the uh, tendons attached to the bone? Yeah. And it is actually, there are growth centers, bony prominences, and there are growth centers because those bony prominences have to grow. And they usually serve as insertions or origins of the major muscles in the origin of the major muscles. But they just, they're a little bit different. That growth center is a little bit different from the physis. A physis usually has compressive forces applied to it, and so it resists compressive forces. Apophyses usually resist distracting forces. Okay, now the muscles in their tendon units are usually stronger than the apophyses, as we can see here. So, if you've got a runner like this and he gets a a, a, a groin pull, which is a tearing of the iliopsoas and the iliacus. In the adult, he'll get a tearing of the muscle, a groin pull. So a so-called groin pull in the adult results in what in the child? Uh, lesser tuberosity avulsion. Um, what? Lesser tuberosity avulsion. Yeah, what, what, is, what fails? The apophysis. Apophysis of what? Where does, where does the psoas attack? Yeah, what you get here is you get a lesser trochanter avulsion that you see here. Okay, so he's a high hurdler and he goes over the hurdles and he gets a sudden pain here. In the adult, what do you have here? Hamstring pull. The hamstrings, the semitendinosus, membranosus, and the biceps get torn or get stretched, yeah, injured. But what do you see in the pediatric age group? Tuberosity. That's right. Yeah, the, f the failure here is the origin of those muscles, and you get a, a, a ischial apophysis avulsion, right. Okay, and this is a dislocated elbow. In the adult, what do you get in the pediatric age group? What fails? Where do the medial collateral ligaments attach? Medial epicondyle. Medial and that's an apophysis, and it's weaker than the medial collateral ligaments. And so you get a medial epicondyle, and that's important as we'll discuss those type of fractures. They can create a very specific type of injury pattern. So, now we'll go back to healing fractures. And healing fractures stimulate growth as a fracture heals. What's happened here? This patient had a fracture of his right femur. This femur fractured, uh, and he's 18 months after that fracture. He was treated years ago in traction, uh, but he comes in now, and what do you see here? You can see his Harris Park growth rest lines. Oh, very on good. The, on the yeah. right side, he's, he's yeah. a little more than on the left. Yeah, and why is that? Uh, due to the overstimulation. That's right. When you have a fracture, you have increased blood supply, and that stimulates the physis to grow a little bit more, and you need to take that into account when you treat fractures. That's why with femoral shaft fractures, you can allow up to a centimeter of shortening because you realize, as we've seen here, this one will grow about a centimeter. Here you can see. So, what are the Harris Park growth arrest lines? Well, they're usually lines of bone density, and that's the position of the growth plate at the time of the insult. It can be either a, an injury or it can be a sickness or some kind of an infection, and, and they're formed in the long bones. It slows down and lays down a little bit more osseous tissue, and with slow down, the bone, more bone is deposited on the ossification area of the physis, and there you see them on the radiographs or cross-section, and the age at which they can form is estimated on the radiograph, and you can determine how much they've grown. It's a good way to tell them. It tells you two things. One, it tells you the bone is growing, because it migrates away from the physis. And anything that slows down the growth rate, so we've seen this, that it can occur. Now we'll go to the basic pathology of fracture healing, the phases of fracture healing. Again, this is why you studied basic histology in medical school. So, here we have a fracture of both the radius and ulna. 
What's the first thing that occurs? It's right after the fracture. You bleed? That's right. So you get an inflammatory phase. And so with that, you get hematoma, and then the hematoma uh, coagulates, and you get fibrin formation, which serves as kind of a, a lattice work for the new production of new healing bone. So what's the next phase? Uh, the, the hematoma begins to organize. Yeah, after, after that, though, it's organized. What's the next phase? Uh, begins to calcify. Not calcify. Calcify. Remember. Yes. Yes. So what happens here? But how does it do that? Well, it, it just kind of laid down in a random manner. Mm -hmm. And it lays down lots of callus quantity bone to get it to heal because it's not very strong bone. And then, and, and so that type is what we call quantity bone. You want to produce a lot of it. You produce a lot of it because it's not very strong bone, but it does go on to heal. So then what happens in the final phase? It remodels. That's right. It remodels into what type of bone? Quality bone. That's right. The bone's laid down along the lines of stress and it remodels. And this is called quality bone. So let's look at the remodeling process. Where, what, what areas remodel the best? Uh, closest to the physis. That's right, the physis. Then where? Metaphysis. Metaphysis. And then finally we have very little remodeling in the diaphysis. So the greatest potential for remodeling occurs in the physis. Here's a patient that was sent to me. 10 days post-fracture, and it was through the physis, and I said, well, we'll put a cast on it. And the mother says, but doctor, the arm is broken. Aren't you going to set it? And so the doctor comes in and <laughs> says, be assured your son has enough remodeling capacity to remodel the fracture. And what happened? Six months, sure enough, that doctor was right. And the mother says, you're great. You should consider a, a career in orthopedics. But this tells you that there was tremendous remodeling with this. We didn't need to set, quote, set the bones. Now, in the metaphysis, we have increased blood flow. So we have a lot of osteogenesis and osteoclasis. And so we have a very awake bony structure. We have a greater remodeling capacity. In the diaphysis, what's going on? Well, they've kind of gone to sleep. You have less blood flow, and you have kind of dormant osteogenesis, and so you have less remodeling capacity. So where does remodeling occur? Well, 75% of it's going to occur in the physis. It's going to realign itself. Only 25% is going to occur in the diaphysis or metaphysis. And so what happens in the physis with the remodeling process? Well, you have unequal forces and so forth, so you have asymmetrical growth. So the first thing that the physis does is it has asymmetrical growth, but it realigns itself. And then once it realigns itself, you have symmetrical growth. And so here's our patient. This was a patient that was non-ambulatory. We decided not to do anything. It was a 10-year-old girl with cerebral palsy, and she was not ambulatory. We just left her alone. She was comfortable. Here she is at 30 degrees. What should that diaphyseal, uh, physeal angle be? Less than 10. No, it should be at 90 degrees. Yeah. Oh. No, it should be perpendicular. Oh. Yeah, it should be perpendicular. Yeah, less than 10 degrees of angulation. That's oh, right. Yes. That's correct. So what should the degree of angle be? Well, here he is at two weeks. Here we are at nine months. As we can see, is it getting better? Yeah. And so here the patient comes back two years, and what do you see? It's back to normal. Yeah, it's realigned itself. But the physis is completely realigned. But what about the diaphysis? Is it fully remodeled? Why is that? It's a hard, less potential to remodel. That's right, exactly right. Yeah, there's still incomplete diaphyseal remodeling, and the reason is it's slower, it does have the less ten tendency to remodel. Remember, 75% is in the physis and only 25% there. Now, 
Here you can see it also depends on how old the individual. This is an infant. This patient has a tremendous remodeling. This is a little bit different. This occurs by Wolf's Law. Wolf's Law, what's Wolf's Law? Uh, it's the response to the stress. Yes, and what is, what is that? More well, stress equals greater size, something yeah. like so, that. Yeah, so on the convex side, you get reabsorption, and on the concave side, you get new bone formation. Okay. So, diaphyseal remodeling, and here you can see this is an infant, has tremendous remodeling, and by 14 months, is completely remodeled. Where does the remodeling occur? Well, in the upper extremity, what, where do you see most of the remodeling? Yeah, that's right. Most of it occurs distal and proximal, as you can see here. Where does it occur in the lower extremity? Distal femur. Yeah, around the knee. So, as you can see, only about 30% of the remodeling occurs in the elbow, whereas in the knee, only about 80% occurs right here. And you need to understand that you don't have a lot of remodeling capacity with fractures about the elbow. So. Here are the factors that affect. What what are the factors that affect remodeling? One, how old they are. Yeah. What's next? How close they are to the joint, as you said, nearest to the physis, and also the relationship to the joint axis. They usually remodel if they're in the alignment of the joint axis was stimulated. So, remember, there's very little rotational remodeling. There's very little remodeling. And here's a good example. This is a good friend of mine gave me this case. He had a fractured femur, and you can see that there was remodeling well in the sagittal and coronal planes, but he did not, they did not correct the rotational angulation, and you can see there's about 18 degrees of difference. Is that going to affect the function? Um, not there's no rotation. It's going to have a little bit of injury. Yeah, right. So here you can see this was his rotational alignment. He, it did result in some loss of rotation in the rotational plane. Now, this is a real challenge. This is a two-year-old that was, had a gunshot, high-velocity gunshot wound. Unfortunately, the nerves and vessels were not injured. So how are you going to treat this one? Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of bone loss there. And yeah. Potential to shorten. Pretty significantly. So how are you gonna how are you gonna prevent that shortening? Uh, you have to keep it to length. Whether it's with how are you gonna do that? Uh, with traction. Very good. That's right. You apply traction, and remember this is a two-year-old, so it has a tremendous remodeling capacity, and that's exactly what the doctor did that saw this patient. He put this child in distal femoral traction, and she was placed in traction. And here you can see at 18 months she's got complete remodeling of it. Because she was only, she was young, and had tremendous remodeling capacity. Here's another one. A three-year-old fell out of a tree in a spike of cast, shows up, was treated in an outpatient in another country, and came to the United States about three weeks later. Oh, my Lord. What are you going to do now? I had three weeks, leave it alone. Leave it, leave it alone, but doctor, it's, is it broken or is it fractured? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so you're going to leave it alone, huh? Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a good decision. Here it is at two months, and here it is at six months. And this was given to us by one of our former residents, Dr. Sanders. Now, <clears throat> I'll look at some specific remodeling very quickly. In the phalanx, you can see it's in the line of plane. You can see the remodeling that occurs here mainly because this is a multi-planar joint. It has both sagittal and coronal motion. And here we have the distal physis, the type A, and <clears throat> you can see three months post-fracture, it's got a lot of angulation. Are we gonna to need to do an osteotomy? No, here it is at 15 months. Now, that uh, shows a great remodeling capacity. Now, this is the opposite direction. This is a type B, a volar displacement, and was placed in a cast, and the cast was not very good, and these are intrinsically unstable, and this patient ended up with this severe volar deformity, and he was, quote, good in sports, and so he had this ugly look and couldn't supinate and ugly deformity, and so the mother was unhappy, and so she filed a suit. It takes two years to 
to get the suit to court, and when they, by the time they got to court, what had happened? He had completely remodeled, and the suit was dropped because he had completely remodeled. Now we've got the distal radial metaphysis. Here you don't have quite as much dramatic remodeling. You still get some, but you still have a little bit of, takes a little bit longer. Notice that the physis has realigned itself, but you still have some remodeling. If you have it in this plane, in the plane of rotation, you may need to be a little bit more aggressive because you have interosseous impingement that may result in loss of rotational motion. Now, reassurance, it's valuable to have a document in the, in the clinic because when they come in, this is a patient that showed up at one week, so I got callus, got angulation, and you can show them this is what the patient looked like at six weeks. And there's a good example to demonstrate the remodeling potential. Here's another one that was even worse. And here you can see we magnify it. And that patient had a lot of displacement. But look at it a year later, you can see it's completely remodeled. And so you, this doctor says that Dr. Brady was correct. These will remodel. And this the radial metaphysis. You can see bayonet apposition. In fact, we now know we don't even need to reduce these because they will completely remodel them, as long as they have two years of growth left. Now, the problems with bayonet is that you need to put it in neutral. If you put it in pronation, you'll get a rotational malalignment, which won't remodel. And this patient ended up with a rotational uh, deficit. Well, so you have to immobilize it in neutral. So, radial shaft fractures, here you can see, we saw this, how this remodels. Now, if the, the ulna is not aligned, the ulna kind of guides the radius, as you can see here. And if it's not aligned, that the ulna will guide the radius in remodeling. If it's crooked, you'll get some remodeling, but you'll still have some angulation. But like our patient here, the ulna is completely straighted, and it remodeled, aligned it, and served as a guide, and we got complete remodeling of the radius. Supracondylar fractures, angulation does not remodel in the coronal plane because it's not in the line. Translocation will remodel in both planes. So this is three weeks post, was not reduced. It's got malalignment in the coronal plane, went on to heal, and it's persisted in the coronal plane, and this ended up with this ugly, cubitus varus deformity. Now, here's another one that showed up at two weeks with simple translocation. As you can see, a periosteal new bone formation. And here's our friendly mother again. And she says, surely you're going to set the bones this time because he has the potential to be good in sports. And the doctor says, be calm. I can assure you that he will remodel enough that he can pitch for the Yankees. And sure enough, he did remodel, and you can see here he is, and here he was 15 years later, and he signed a million dollar bonus. <laughs> so, remember translocation, as you can see here, will remodel. Notice how the translocation has remodeled, but the angulation, completely remodeled, angulation only has limited remodeling. So you see this here, tremendous remodeling capacity. Now, here's another one, tremendous remodeling capacity. The periosteum guides that, new bone formation, and this is one. But if they don't have much growth left, this one has a lot of growth left, and this one ended up with a full range of motion. But this girl here was 14 years old, was pretty much skill, almost skeletally mature, and she ended up with a prominence and she had to have surgery to correct it. She didn't remodel. So athletes that need to use their upper extremities for highly competitive activities. This boy here had some remodeling, but not quite enough that he could do it. So you have to determine what their skill set and so forth is. We saw this before in the humerus. Here's a good example. This was a three-year-old high energy placed in immediate spica by the resident in the emergency room. The shaft went on to heal, got shortening, plus angulation. What does that equal? Well, that equals trouble when you get shortening plus angulation. So he's getting, he's, he's remodeling actually pretty well 
the angulation. Angulation is better, but the shortening has persisted. And he got a good lawyer, came in three years post-injury, and he had almost four centimeters of shortening, and so they settled for $200,000, and that equals $60,000 per centimeter. Now, this is the final one. This is a mother, child, father says, and the doctor says, that's a simple undisplaced fracture. All it needs is a simple long leg cast. Uh-oh, look what happened. Took the cast off, and he's crooked. And the mother says, you didn't set it right. And he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, the bone, big bones grow faster, causing it to be crooked. And she says, you're just telling me that because you didn't set it right in the first place. So what are you going to do about my daughter's leg? And so to placate her, you did a medial closing wedge proximal tibial osteotomy. And so you get a beautiful result. It's straight. Regional growth restor lines. Notice that there's asymmetry in the growth here. We'll discuss in another lecture that this fracture has this unique asymmetry uh, healing process. And so the mother here is very happy because it's straight. And she says, you're wonderful. The leg is now straight. But there's nothing any more hamling than long term. He comes back a year later and the valgus has recurred and the mother is no longer your friend. She says, you didn't do the surgery right. So it's best to wait. Here's this patient at two and a half years, came back at 15 years and is completely corrected. And notice that it corrected at the physis. Still has a little bit of S shape in the tibia. And the mother's very happy. She's a little bit older now. And she says, you were right to wait. So the message is, children have tremendous remodeling capacity, but you need to know the limits of remodeling. It's essential to achieve a good result. And the mother says, you better learn those concepts before you treat my daughter. So thank you very much for your indulgence. Thank you. Mm -hmm.